Hello and welcome to another episode of The Brothers Discuss. I am Alex. And I'm Chris. Um, well, before we get started, I feel like we should uh, continue our coverage of the, the ongoing writer strike, which is still, like I said, it's still ongoing. Um, we talked about this in the last episode, but it's insane that this is still happening to me. Uh, and we have now we've gotten to the point where actors are going on strike as well to get this moving and I don't know when it's going to end. Interesting. So, yeah, so I, I haven't followed up on this really at all. So this is going to be, like, mainly your takeaway, and I'll just react. Yeah. Accordingly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the writer's strike is still happening. And, Chris, we talked about the films and TV shows that were heavily affected by the 2007 writer's strike. So let's talk about what's been affected by this one, what's going ahead and what's not going ahead and what's been – paused i guess uh it's largely a lot of marvel projects which i I did see today like disney's new slate or like the their their new schedule of movies coming out like deadpool 3 got pushed up actually which is interesting it did and that that's the we'll get to that one in a bit but uh, lots of things have been uh moved around by a few months and some by like a couple years i think Mm -hmm. and which is funny because like you know the pandemic screwed up marvel's clockwork system of churning these things out like i mean we got a whole year without projects and now we're not getting this as of right now but maybe it could happen you never know yeah yeah so we like we went a whole year without them releasing anything but yeah like things like thunderbolts the wonder man show like those have all been pushed back um what else i mean and cats america i mean that recently has been they they wrapped filming recently, uh, but we also got the news that that has a new title. It is now called Captain America: Brave New World, and I'm not gonna lie, I think that's a lame title. <laughs> I do prefer New World Order. <laughs> yeah, uh, Daredevil also had its production halted, and, and and they only really just started filming that. Um, there was a period of time where. The Daredevil show started filming, and the Penguin show had been filming for a while, and they were both in New York. And I just remember thinking, like, you could walk down the street and just see both productions if you were so inclined. I mean, we have Colin Farrell with Bullseye. That's the connecting tissue right there. <laughs> um, but then uh, the Batman 2. Originally, that was uh, scheduled to be uh, to begin filming in november now that's been pushed to march and uh, this is just a, a side tidbit that I, I found out apparently the the venue that was used for the iceberg lounge that's closed now oh interesting yeah and it's been like renovated to like an office space but they're gonna reopen the venue in 2026 so i don't understand how you go from in the same turning place? the venue into an office space to go back into a venue that's in a few weird. Years, I, I don't get it. So if you're hoping to see more of the Iceberg Lounge, um, it'll probably look very different. Uh, but you could say it got flooded in, in the first movie. Sure. So I would imagine the flood would be a good explanation for why it looks different. And the, the, the Penguin is making more money than ever with these upgrades. Yeah, I, I'm fine with that. But yeah. wouldn't you want to capitalize on this like like this is the location the batman was filmed in like that could be an actual site you can go to and be like oh this is the club the batman was filmed in like i don't know it's weird that it's now an office only to become a club again (laughs) yeah it's like wouldn't it be crazy like you do a nine to five making cold calls and that's also where batman pushed the penguin up against the wall just the proprietor (laughs) <laughs> like that <laughs> that happened where someone is now doing their nine to five it's pretty yep. crazy to me it's, it's pretty interesting yeah <laughs> uh but there is one project we do have to talk about uh we mentioned the last episode that one of the big films that got affected from the 2007 writer strike was x-men origins wolverine and hugh jackman is about to come back as wolverine and reunite with ryan reynolds who who was also an x-men origins wolverine and deadpool's deadpool 3's production is not only going ahead, but it's going to get released a few months earlier, uh, uh, during the writer's strike, again. It's a curse. You know, th- those you two know, those two together. 
history repeats itself. They can't yeah. be in a good film together. This is it. Like it must be affected by something drastic in the industry that will hurt it. So sorry, Hugh. You should have picked a better comeback. <laughs> um, but the other big news that that's come from this is that Ryan Reynolds um, is technically a writer for this movie. I mean, he was a. I think he had a writing credit for Deadpool two, and because he's a member of the Writers Guild, he can't make changes or do ad libs at all in this production. Mm. But it got me thinking: like, can he hypothetically come up with jokes between takes and have like Hugh Jackman suggest them? Probably. I mean, they get away with that? <laughs> like, I, I think Hugh was the one to come up with. Uh, what do they call you? Wheels. Like, I think that was his idea in the first film. Like, because I think the original line was, "What do they call you, Baldy?" I mean, I don't know which one's more offensive, but <laughs> maybe Ryan whispers to someone like the director, um, uh, Sean Levy, uh, wh- what about this for a line? And Sean Levy stands with his finger in the air like, I have an idea. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's how it goes. Maybe, but, maybe. <laughs> so, I mean, you and I are fans of good movies, but we are also fans of chaos and big film productions. Chaos. <laughs> uh, that's something we find some amusement in. I mean, of, of course, we don't wish any real harm on any of these productions, but it would be funny given the scale of this film. Like, the, the, it'd be one thing if this is like an up and coming indie director, but this is Deadpool three, mm-hmm. so I'd be down for the chaos. Uh, but there is a rumor going around that James Marsden, uh, Famke Jansen, and Halle Berry are also going to be in Deadpool three because. Halle Berry posted a photo on on her Instagram where she had storm hair again. And I don't know how that drags the other two into it, but, I mean, Marsden has been asked about returning a Cyclops recently quite a bit because he's been in things recently, and people have been saying, oh, Hugh Jackman's coming back. Patrick Stewart came back. Are you coming back? And he's like, oh, sure, if they ask me, which I guess is the standard answer. I mean, why would you expect him to say anything else? Right. And... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cyclops cameoed in Deadpool two, and I didn't care about that. I don't, I don't care about this. So I, I can't wait for Deadpool to make fun of Cyclops, so the audience can laugh, and uh, it'll just make me want to kill myself in front of everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we'll see how this writer strike uh, continues to unfold. Hopefully, it doesn't go on for too much longer. Uh. Let's talk movies. Um, you've seen some movies. Why don't you tell me about them? Um, so, yeah, I saw... I, I, I guess you could say I've been seeing, like, the big blockbuster movies, if that's even a saying anymore. The summer season has begun. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's in full throttle right now. And um, so I, I guess going back, technically I, I actually started this off with Fast X. Anyways, I'm going to talk about The Little Mermaid. Um, it was all right, you know. If you've seen The Little Mermaid, the original one, you kind of know what's going on here. There's just a few added songs, you know. Have you seen I, much of the live-action Disney remakes? I, 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 that actually got me thinking recently, and I, the only one I think I've seen all the way through is Jungle Book. Um, and that's I, one I, of the good seen, ones. Yeah, <laughs> so... I, I guess I'm on the the softer side of the the live action remakes. I mean, I I saw the like 101 Dalmatian live action movies way back in the day, but <laughs> um, but in terms of like this recent surge of like live action remakes, that Jungle Book is the only one that I've, I've watched. I mean, I've seen uh, your movie sucks video on Lion King, so I've effectively seen that movie, but <laughs> um. Outside of that, no, it's it's just been that and this, and, you know, it's fine, I guess. So if I can't ask you if it's better or worse than the Beauty and the Beast one. No, yeah, I haven't seen that. Um, I hated that one. I, I genuinely <laughs> hate it. Uh, I, I don't really want to see that because Beauty and the Beast is generally one of my favorite Disney animated movies. and Same. And I, I, I just don't need another one, but it's like... Little Mermaid, you know, I, I really enjoy the original one, and um, this one's good, and it's, it's got some newer songs. Some of them are all right, some of them not so much, but, um, you know, it, it, 
it looks pretty, I guess. Uh, I feel like Disney finally found that that compromise with their uh, CGI uh, creatures, not making them look too realistic like they did with Lion King, but not overwhelmingly cartoonish, just that fine line of mm. cartoony and silly and fun. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that was Little Mermaid. Nothing too much to say about it. <laughs> What else have you seen? Uh, well, I, today actually, I just saw Transformers Six, and I'm not even kidding. Is it seven? That's that's what it's labeled as, like in the theaters. Like I get it, really? it can only fit so much. But it's the seventh like, Transformers movie, though. Yeah, but the Bum- Bumblebee is so far apart from all of these. <laughs> so okay, so as someone who hasn't seen this movie yet, I, I may go see it. Like your, the way you describe this movie. It's up to you to sell me on this movie. Uh, it's all <laughs> okay. on you. So okay. is this a sequel to Bumblebee? Yes. Okay. Um, there, There is like one line that is a reference to Bumblebee. And okay. it, it kind of goes in line with Optimus Prime being a, a complete murdering douchebag in this movie. <laughs> this Which I the gap between I, I, Bumblebee and the Michael Bay Transformers movies. Well, okay. No matter how hard you try, you can't connect any of these movies together. <laughs> um, the, like I mean, the extra that, that, movies at this point. Oh my god, it's so much worse. <laughs> I mean, it, it is... <laughs> no, nothing in any of these movies stick together. That's why, like, Bumblebee works so well, is because it's just a screw everything else we're just gonna make a movie and bumblebee works in that regards and um because like i don't really remember the the fifth transformers movie that well i, I saw it the anthony one, hopkins uh, that, that did have anthony hopkins where he said dude and <laughs> that was that, that was fun but i remember like the big threat in that movie kind of I mean, there's a lot of threats in that movie, but, like, the big one was, like, Unicron, which is, I, I think in Transformers lore, I guess, that is kind of like the Thanos for Transformers. It was in the, um, it was in the animated movie. Okay. Voiced okay. by Orson Welles. And that's also kind of the main threat in this one. So, like, yeah. none none of this matters anymore. This This whole <laughs> thing isn't connected to anything anymore. I kind of think like this this whole thing is just getting rebooted, but it's still contained enough to keep some of the like the basic things that happen in the Bay movies still mm-hmm. part of all of this. Like there's no Megatron or any references to that in this one. Yeah. It, it's it, it's Are there it, any it, like pop brownie jokes? Does anyone get high in this movie? Uh I don't think so. I don't. I don't really remember, honestly. <laughs> oh my god! All, all I remember is Optimus Prime wanting to murder everyone. But, <laughs> oh god. um, and hey, that that those parts of the movie were really entertaining. Um, it was a pretty heavy Optimus movie. Okay. You don't really get that anymore. Um. So I mean, you know what you're getting into with the Transformers movie. Uh, it's not as, like, dumb as, as the Michael Bay movies, and I, I mean that in a very specific way, um, where, like, I mean, yeah, the, this movie is still pretty dumb, but it, it's, it's more like, I don't know what you would even say, I mean, I don't know, y- you know Transformers, again, you, you know what you're getting into with this, uh, it's definitely not Bumblebee, it, it's not up to that right. level, um, in terms of like genuine quality and craftsmanship put into it and just actually feeling like a movie that this is more on the line of like a theme park ride, but um, you know, you can get a kick out of certain things, including my Optimus prime being a murder robot. Um, and he, he has, he has a few lines that remind me of like one of my favorite lines he had in Revenge of the Fallen, which is "Give me your face." <laughs> so, if you want to see the movie for that, I definitely recommend it. 
So but, check out the latest um, Transformers movie directed by Stephen King. Oh, not not Stephen King. Stephen Cap- Cappell Jr. Yes. That was an impressive bit with Stephen King. Stephen King. <laughs> um, yeah. Transformers Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Check it out. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably uh, check this out on if I have like a free week, a free afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so from the sounds of it, it doesn't sound like it's a must see. No, it's not absolutely. like a, a movie we'll talk about later in the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So I guess it's my turn to talk about with some movies before we get to Go the main for event. It. Um. So let's talk about still. Uh, this is the Michael J. Fox uh, Apple Plus documentary. So you've not seen this one, right? I have not, no. So it's a documentary about Michael J. Fox, which takes influence from one of his autobiographies. I, I think the thing I like about it, I mean, obviously the story of Michael J. Fox is uplifting and tragic as well, but just quickly as a documentary, I, I really enjoyed how it used archival footage accompanying his voiceovers and his interviews because he does the talking heads where he's being interviewed by the documentarian, but he also does voiceovers, which I I believe are also passages from his book. Um, There is some reenactments in in the movie, in the film, but every chance they get of using an era appropriate Michael J. Fox and archival footage they use. And I just really appreciated that. And I just wanted to, Shout that out because I enjoyed that. But uh, I think this is a very solid recommendation for me to, to check it out. It, it's a very moving and very entertaining documentary. And, yeah, I, I like Michael J. Fox. So, yeah. Uh, next one I've got is Fool's Paradise. This is the uh, directorial debut of Charlie Day. And oh, I didn't know it was directed by him. It was, and he's also a writer, and he's the, the lead as well. So the, the very basic premise of this film is that it's about a man who can't speak, and he gets roped into a Hollywood lifestyle, and it parodies Hollywood shit. And You sound so excited. So, okay. So... <laughs> There's things I like about the movie quite a bit, but it being a comedy was not one of them. Mm, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it has a very low Ron Smather score. It's at a 16%. Ooh, wow. So I appreciate that he made something that you wouldn't expect him to make because I imagine he had, you know, I imagine he has writing credits on Always Sunny in Philadelphia, but I think a lot of people outside of that know him from horrible bosses and those kinds of, you know, broad comedy movies. So for him to not make something as broad as that and to make something very, very specific, I I do appreciate because it would be easy to just go, oh, I'll I'll just make something I'm already famous for. Obviously, he has a lot of love for silent films. There's a lot of Charlie Chaplin in his character, and it's all about the, the, the crazy Hollywood lifestyle that he has. And... There's a lot in this movie, and unfortunately, some of the stuff it parodies, like, I, I, under, I understand what it's a satire of, but it feels wrong and not accurate enough. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jason Sudeikis is in the film, and he obviously know. I mean, he, he knows Charlie Day through Horrible Bosses and some other films they've been in together. He plays, I want to say, a kind of Michael Bay director. But it just looks like he makes, like, Roland Emmerich films and, like, Fast and Furious kind of movies. But because you see (laughs) posters on the walls of, like, sexy ladies on top of cars and everything. But the font is meant to be Fast and Furious. But that's not what those movies look like. And then he's essentially making a parody of Ant-Man. But he's a mosquito instead. And they say, oh, it's kind of bottom of the barrel. And that, that's what people were saying about Ant-Man at, at the time. But then you see the suit that he wears. And he's got, like, paint on his face. Not like Mystique or Nebula or any of those characters. And, and, the, and the suit doesn't look like a Marvel suit. Like, he should be in one of those gray suits with, like, tennis balls on it. Like, that's mm-hmm. what he should be wearing. Like, they didn't do that. So it felt wrong. Like, I, I can understand what you're going for. But it's not an accurate enough 
of a parody. So that kind of frustrated me a little bit. Um, I appreciate that Charlie Day tried to make something that would stick with people by having some social commentary, but I, I didn't really like it very much. So I'm I'm sorry, Charlie Day. But I will <laughs> say to Charlie Day, who's definitely listening to this podcast, um, don't give up. I really hope you do make another movie because I'd really like to see him tr- try to make something else because I think he's a fine director. Okay. Um. So I also watched Blackberry. And uh, I really, really like Blackberry. Uh, it, it feels like this year especially, there's been a lot of corporate-based, like, you know, based on true story movies of guys trying to make it in the corporate world. Air was the really big one, and I didn't really like Air that much. I did speak about it a couple episodes ago. I mean, I liked it, but it didn't, I, I didn't think it was anything special. And I saw a lot of people really praising it, and I was like, really? Okay. Um there's a movie about the flaming hot Cheeto that's out now, and Tetris. That that's another one. It, it just feels like there's a lot of movies like that, but it, this feels different to those. Like this was more in line with something like, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's like the Social Network because that's a very big claim, but it's more in line with the Social Network than it is Ben Affleck's Air to me. <laughs> there's yeah, some okay. very very good performances in it. Uh, Glenn Howerton is fantastic in the film he plays the very corporate businessman type that sees these nerdy 20 year olds who made this phone but don't know how to market it or don't know how to pitch it Uh, he comes along and is the guy that really gets it up and running in in the business world and uh jay baruchel plays the the main inventor of the blackberry and and then there's uh matt johnson who is his best friend and is also the director of the film which i didn't realize until afterwards but he gives a really good performance as well, and I did not know this man at all. Like I was both impressed by his performance and his direction, but it's shot almost documentary style. Like shows like you know like like The Office will have these sudden crash zooms to, to give off the vibe of a documentary. Uh, this film also has that, but it's also, and I, look, I got to be honest, I can't really tell the difference between film and digital. But I assume this was shot on digital and given a film grain in post. But there is grain that makes it feel like a film that was made in the 90s or early 2000s. And I appreciate okay. that because that's obviously when the film is set. But a really, really funny script. And But it's not obvious funny. Like I, I don't know how to describe it because I wouldn't call it a broad comedy, but just a really entertaining film about a subject matter that doesn't really interest me that much but the blackberry was pre-smartphone it was kind of the first of those style phones that people got addicted to using because it had that really big keyboard you and you could send emails with it and it was revolutionary for its time and they do cover this in the movie but the iphone comes along and changes the game and the company is at risk of becoming obsolete uh Mm -hmm. because that's the way the world moved on, as we all know. Uh, you go into the movie knowing that the BlackBerry is not the biggest phone in the world anymore. So how do you make that dramatic? How do you make that entertaining? Because we already know the ending a little bit. So where I felt Air kind of didn't do much for me in terms of making that suspenseful, this really did for me. So I'd recommend BlackBerry, and you could rent it online. Um, I would recommend it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so before we get into the main event, I, I kind of feel like we have to uh, talk about the movie that's coming out this week. It will be coming out this week, and that is the Flash. Um, just one final get final words in before we see it for ourselves. Uh, this is a movie that's been in production for like seventy years, more or less, at this point. And we've got we've had various director changes. At, at, at one point, Phil Lord and Chris Miller were were attached to direct this. Really, I did not know that. You, you didn't know that? No, <laughs> that was years ago. But, it, but but the point is, this movie was part of that initial slate of announcements for DC, where you know, like Cyborg was slated to be released in 2020. Uh, it was up there. So it's been, it's been in development for a very long time and you've had various director changes and now that it's about to come out in the past few months we've had people hyping it up i mean james gunn obviously 
I mean, he has to just because he's the head of DC films now. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then you had Tom Cruise start to praise. It's like, oh, it's Tom Cruise. He he's he's hyping up. And I speaking of Stephen King, Stephen King hyped this up recently. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) And then the reviews come in because the embargo lifts. And it's now like a 70 something on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's like this was supposed to be the best movie ever. And it's (laughs) just an okay movie. It's just an okay movie. Uh, so what do you have to say about all that? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I don't want to speak out of line here. Because, I mean, I, I haven't looked at any reviews. Um, but if, if I had to guess, and I'm not saying every review is like this, but a lot of them probably do have to address the elephant in the room, which, which of course is Ezra Miller. Um, and again, I want to speak out of line. I don't know how that affects the reviews in any way, but that might, I, I honestly don't know, but mm-hmm. I mean, to me, that is the, that is the least shocking thing in the world though, that like, I, I mean, I looked at this movie and like when the trailer came out, I'm like, the, the hype around it is, was just so enormous for a bathtub explosion, basically. A, a, a little kid grabbed some some older toys, some newer toys, and just Michael played with Shannon, the It's funny you say that, because Michael Shannon recently, like, said that he doesn't think his performance is as, like, nuanced as his performance in Man of Steel, and he kind of equated it to, like, the, the multiverse concept as a kid playing with toys. I, I mean, that's... Seriously, that that kind of is what it looks like. <laughs> Um, b- both just like uh, on on a story level and just the visual nature of it too. It, it just looks so. I mean, it, we can already see it in the trailers, like the 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 big final set pieces on a flat desert. I mean that it's so unimaginative and where the just, horizon is basically at the same middle line, middle of the sc- the screen the whole time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. So, you know, there's something to be said for how Rotten Tomatoes, you know, people on both sides, whether it's the fans or the critics, it's a helpful tool or it's the worst thing in the industry. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners know this, but the score for the critic score is the average of all these certified critics reviews. So right. it, it is not something percent is a high percentage of critics who liked it. Sure. But then yeah. if you think about it as a score out of 100 that a single entity is giving it, then obviously a 70 is not that high. But like, for example, the like the Hawkeye TV show that has like a 92 percent on Rotten Tomatoes or something like that. But if you think of it as a score out of 100, 92 is awfully high. But then mm-hmm. if you think of it as was Hawkeye good or bad? Well, I thought it was good. So if most people thought it was good, then it should be a high rating. Right? So you have to think of it, of it like that. But you think about how overhyped this Flash movie is. It, it's meant to be both a jumping on point and it's meant to be the finale for this DCEU that we've had for like a decade now. And Michael Keaton's back. Michael Shannon's back. The, the whole multiverse gimmick has, you know, o- outside of the Spider-Verse, uh, which we'll, we'll get into, <laughs> has really run its course for me. And Part of that is because it's been overused for DC. I mean, obviously, we've had some Marvel shows and movies use it recently, but those CW shows really, really used it. And now we're at the point where we've brought back Michael Keaton's Batman. Who is there left to bring back if they want to do another one of these? Uh, I don't think... I mean, okay, let's say they give Christian Bale enough money to come back, so I guess he'd be the big one. But that's really it. Like, we've used Michael Keaton, and now we're already kind of stretching in terms of how many people there are that would still be excited to see Michael Keaton, because Michael Keaton's Batman is a long time before Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. So we're at the right age group for people to see him and his supporting characters and get excited for that. Uh, With Keaton's Batman, we're just at the tail end of the age group of people who would have interest in that. But in terms of overhyped for a movie 
I mean, its opening week and projections are kind of low for what they were expecting, e- even amongst all the hype from Tom Cruise and James Gunn and all these people. And I'm not surprised to hear that because I, I, I also think about how in the general public, I mean, we step outside of the bubble we're all part of in terms of knowing movie news and who's directing a movie and things like that. The general public who might be aware that like, the Flash TV show is a thing and that just ended – and there's also a Flash movie that's about to come out. Like, how confusing would that be? Like, I thought, like, I thought the Flash is already a thing. I thought that that just finished. Is there already a movie with a different guy? And wasn't Michael Keaton's Batman from the 80s? Like, I, I, I just think of these sorts of things that, that to the general public would be so confusing. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a pretty good point. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah, and it's the same with, uh, again, it's the same with Spider-Verse that we're going to talk about in a moment, <laughs> because they're, in terms of confusion. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, uh, that that's just because you you're jumping back and forth between Spider-Man constantly, basically. <laughs> so, But but I, I often wonder if this overhypedness that comes along has been an attempt to take the spotlight away from Ezra Miller being the lead. So that might be a part of it as well. I mean... Yeah, Ezra Miller's in it, but it's a really good movie. I mean, and James Gunn has a responsibility to hype this up in his current role, but you also damage your, your reputation if you put all your chips on making on, on something being this great if the general public don't see it that way. Then mm-hmm. it's like that embarrassing Max Landis tweet about how bright was his Star Wars. <laughs> uh, but then... At the same time, there's also, in the rumor mill right now, uh, the director of The Flash, uh, Andy uh, Machete, is that how you say his name? Something like that, yeah. Uh, apparently, he's in the runnings to direct uh, the the Batman Brave and the Bold movie for James Gunn. Okay. And, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i curious about what his, what his Batman stuff will look like in this movie before I pass judgment, but, I mean, I mean, the It movies have a good atmosphere, so... Maybe. I don't know. Did you ever see It Chapter 2? <laughs> I don't know if I did, actually. I can't remember if I did. I mean, it had things McAvoy. So. No, yeah. Maybe it, he could play Batman. <laughs> there you go. Hey. Uh, do you have anything else to say about Flash? Because, I mean, we'll we'll get into this movie when it comes out this week. Yeah, I mean, what, what said has basically been said. I mean... I am, like, if I have any excitement, it's more so of a curiosity of just, like, you know, obviously this movie's been hyped, it's been overhyped, and I I don't really have high expectations for it, Uh, and it, it just kind of feels like a return to, like, some of those earlier DC movies where it's just, it's just chaos on screen of just weird and dumb things happening, and like it, like it, and we haven't really had that in DC in a while. DC's been, uh, well, m- for the most part recently, DC's been a little bit more artsy with their stuff, uh, with like the Suicide Squad and all that. But, um, you know, but I mean, if you go back, I, I think I said like the same thing about like No Way Home before that came out. I was in it for the curiosity, and that actually turned out to be a pretty decent movie. Yeah. So. You, you don't know. I don't expect this to be the worst movie in the world. I don't expect this to be no. like Black Adam. Like where that <laughs> to me, Black Adam is like on the same level as something like Venom, where it's like I, I have no desire to ever watch this again. <laughs> I don't expect it to be on that level. But sure. We'll, we'll I, I do I do expect like some quality. If I have any expectations, I'm gonna say the first half or maybe even just the first third of this movie, will be decent, at the very least. <laughs> that's my prediction. That's all, all right. I have. <laughs> all right. Is it time for the main event? Uh, the, the canon event, you said? Oh, all right. Well, let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> We're, of course, talking about Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. Uh, before we get into it, I, let me ask you a very important question to start this off. Mm-hmm. Were you able to hear this movie? Oh, I, I heard about this. The the audio things got fixed. 
or something? Yeah, it's like a video game patch, essentially, what the runaway story of this is. Uh, did you have problems in your theater? No, I mean, I saw it twice, and both times sounded perfectly fine. Okay, <laughs> so I did have it. Um, I, I saw this in two different theaters. I've seen it twice already, and I've seen it in two different theaters, one of which was in IMAX. Um, so the first time I saw this, I had difficulty hearing... Uh, I had trouble hearing what Gwen was saying in her opening monologue. Um, besides that, I've heard people had some trouble understanding what Spider-Punk was saying. And I don't know if that's more audio leveling or if that's an accent people aren't familiar with. And he's speaking really fast. I'm gonna say I, that. I understood him fine, but I've, I've had people tell me they didn't understand a word he was saying until he said, like, I salute you or, or something like that. But the second <laughs> viewing, I heard things better. But I, I was thinking that it, it could be a theater thing. Like when Tenet came out, people were talking about how Nolan doesn't know how to level his movies. The, the sound level's all over the place. But in one theater, I had no problem. And then another theater, I had problems. Maybe this is a theater problem. That that That's probably what I'm thinking. Because, I mean, it, again, it... I saw it twice. One of them for me was an IMAX too. So yeah, I mean, they, they, they both sounded fine. I, I I picked up on more lines on my second viewing, but I think that was just because I was just paying more attention to the lines mm-hmm. that time around. So I I don't think it was um uh, like an actual problem with the movie itself for me. But yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah, so that, that's something to think about. But I I largely heard the movie fine. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess to start things off, um, I'll just briefly cap off my thoughts on the first film, Into the Spider-Verse, where with that film, I went into that movie without not having the highest of expectations for that movie, but then I was blown away by it, and oh, it was yeah. amazing, <laughs> and it, I still stand by, it's my favorite movie of 2018, but also one of my favorite movies of the, the whole decade if, I, if i'm gonna be honest it's seri- like especially after re-watching it to watch this it is seriously one of the best movies ever made and like yeah um, it just has like the most I, I mean at the time anyway it had the most unique animation of all time and it kind it was mm-hmm. kind of the, the the template for some other animated movies that have come out recently like i know you saw the puss and boots movie and and i did too uh, that Ninja was clearly Turtles like out, has that style. And yeah, it has that style. The new Ninja Turtles movie that's coming out this year definitely has that style as well. And uh, but then when it came to the hype for this movie, I mean, obviously there there was hype for it, but I think once it got closer to its release, I think that hype died down. And I think I remember thinking that there wasn't some of hype going into this anymore. And the closer we got to it, but I thought it was more that everyone was like, "Oh, we know this one's going to be good," whereas. The Flash is, is something that can go either way. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess to kick things off, um, this is a movie that I've my my thoughts on it have changed drastically <laughs> um, from the first time I saw it to to now, because when I first watched this this movie. I was admittedly a little mixed, and I kind of gave you a heads up ahead of time, and I think I, I worried that that may, may have tainted your experience with the movie. I mean, I'm, it, it's really hard to explain because I, I guess I'll go through my reactions really fast. The first time I watched this, more than anything, I was really bothered by the pacing of the movie, um, which, like, I, I, I think it was just because... It is still technically, I'm doing this in quotations, it is still technically a kid's movie at the end of the day. <laughs> um, and it's pretty long for a kid's movie. It's, I think the length is two hours, 20 minutes. Yeah, it's pretty long. That, uh, that, for uh, Again, for a kid's movie, that that's considerably long. And especially, like, as you keep going to the ending, and even in the beginning a little bit, um... Uh, you, you de- for me at least the first viewing I definitely felt it was just this is really taking its time um, to the point where like in in the the opening scene or like the opening credits 
like it's so sudden i'm like oh i thought the movie we'd already been in it for a while now and then bam there's the opening credits like columbian Pre- uh, pictures presents and i'm like oh i guess that was the opening scene uh but like on a second viewing stuff like that was smoothed out a lot more just probably because i just i knew what i was going into i knew what to expect um but i i, I still uh overall like i think the the structure is still like imbalanced just because the third act of this movie is the last five minutes of it um <laughs> and we'll wait a few more months to see the rest of it but um overall the pacing did feel a lot better on a second viewing but i was on on a second viewing i found more issues and i will probably talk about this a lot yeah with the Canada event, which I alluded to earlier, um, and kind of the the rules of how this whole thing works and how it plays into the story. Yeah, because uh, I, so I have I things do, to say about it. Yeah, yeah, I Go do ahead. have similar issues with you, but I think I've warmed to this movie like considerably since then. Like after, like when I first watched this movie, I gave it three and a half stars in Letterbox, and then I I slept on it, and the next morning I woke up and like. Oh, that's that, that seems a little too low. Cause I, I was thinking about it some more, and I, I ended up thinking there's a lot I really like about this movie. So I'll raise that to four stars. Then I saw it a second time. I for whatever reason the second time I think I was on the movie's level. Like I think I was playing by its terms, and I kind of think it's brilliant. <laughs> and <laughs> so now it's at a, a four and a half. But I was very tempted to go five. Okay. Um, so um, I don't think it's that it's better than Into the Spider Verse in terms of a story. Like I think the first film that that's the, in addition to that film having brilliant animation, the the, the script is really tight in that film. Y- yes, it um, is a top notch script. The, the and, overall just like flow of the movie is just a, a lot more tight and coherent than yeah. this one. Which, like again, that, that, that was only a large problem my first viewing was, man, this is really taking its time. Uh-huh. Um, largely because, well, it, it's one giant movie that's cut in half. It's not really a two-parter. It, it, it's just one big thing that just happens to be in two halves. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, I, I, I rated it three and a half, and it's still a three and a half. And that might change because, I mean, I... Might I, I change might what have I have to say, what I have to drop to you. Well, okay, well, here's the thing. It, it might change in the future solely on Beyond the Spider-Verse. Mm. Uh, anytime soon, probably not. It's it's probably going to okay. stay that score for a little bit. Because how I feel about the things that I like and don't like could change on the flip of a dime with beyond the spider verse in both a positive or a negative way like it it, and i i think that's why i i have a definitely much more of a lower score i mean the average score for that movie is like a 4.6 or something yeah these have gotten like like universal praise from i know critics i i know and and and, i mean a lot of it's well deserved i i really loved like a lot of this movie and then there's I just think some if there's one thing I think you and I can both agree on in terms of what is an improvement over the first film, I would say it's the animation. For sure, for sure. Because the, the, the ambition level on this movie is incredible. Like, <laughs> yes. That is, that goes without saying. But, I mean, we mentioned earlier about people not being aware of certain movie news and things like that, but I also know that people... That there are people like us that forgot this was that this was originally a part one. So when people have been outraged by the ending, I mean, I don't really get it personally. Like, what's the big deal? I mean, it's a great ending. A cliffhanger can be a great ending. Um, oh yeah, people... no, I don't. I don't have the issue of the fact that the the movie ended in a cliffhanger. It, it's mm. it, it's more the fact. Well, another thing I I also want to bring up. I, I mentioned Fast X earlier. <laughs> um <laughs> and i mean you haven't seen it but i'm just gonna say it anyways yeah. spoilers sure, i guess fine. you haven't seen fast x but it is a two-parter possibly three-parter three uh, vin vin diesel has alluded There's to an idea that actually three movies yeah <laughs> uh 
Um, oh, there, there hasn't been any confirmations, and then on Letterbox, I mean, there's Fast X Part Two, which is mm. kind of dumb. Um, they didn't call <laughs> it Part One, but um, there hasn't been confirmation of a third one. But Vin Diesel, I think at the premiere, said it could go to three, and I'm like, of course it could, but. <laughs> But like that, that kind of got interesting, and that movie, it literally just ends. Like, there's not really an ending. It just, it, it just ends. And I feel like, and and it also got me thinking. Wait a sec, Mission Impossible is also about to be a two parter. It is. And and, you, you, and if you want to go one step further, you even have Dune Part Two coming out later this year. Right. Yes. And I, I think what happened is that Infinity War and Endgame came out. They made collectively close to five billion dollars. And interestingly, and, Infinity War was originally meant to be a two-parter movie. It, it was meant to be a two-parter, but I think what separates like those to all of these is is that Infinity War and Endgame. Uh, I mean, they 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 work together terrifically as companion pieces. Like they they have you know paralleling themes and ideas and shots and all these things that work together like one movie would. Mm-hmm. But you can still watch either one on its own and co- be completely satisfied. Um, and uh, it, despite it having a cliffhanger ending, and you know, it, it shows you can do all of that stuff um, in ways Fast X cannot. <laughs> right. Um, and with with Spider Verse, you know, this again, it, it just feels very dependent on beyond the spider verse how i feel about this movie it it could change completely in terms of how i'll feel about beyond the spider verse and i just don't know yet so i don't really have like concrete standings on this movie i mean there there are plenty of things i love about it Mm -hmm. uh like the first half of this movie i especially rewatching it completely in love with it i mean it is so like just beautiful to watch and like the the direction and the the acting and the the dialogue it's all so well delivered and handled mm-hmm. i mean um, we get cra- it go it does get crazy multiversal stuff later in the, like the second half of the movie but the it, first it's, half it's is largely half. It's largely a character like a slow paced character piece with yeah. like Gwen and Miles and yeah I, I was pleasantly surprised by that for sure like it it felt like uh, the, the first half of it actually genuinely like it just felt like it picked straight up from into the spider verse mm. uh despite like a different flow it was slower but you know a little bit more satisfying because he had all these like really you know beautiful moments in the film um and i i think once you get to the spider society it becomes chaos not bad in any means like it's definitely fun and entertaining to watch mm. but it gets a little bit more chaotic around then, um, and it introduces the canon event, which I'm really hyping up because I, I have some stuff to say about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> but I want to talk about Gwen's world real quick. Uh, okay. Because – so this – like, to describe it, uh, it's kind of – I mean, first of all, if you've not seen this and you're watching this um, – Wow, way to ruin this for yourself. But just watch it. Just uh, watch it. But <laughs> to describe it, it, like it's kind of like watercolor, like backdrops, essentially, and then like, but it's kind of like Vibrance. a like like a mood ring, essentially, where it just changes colors depending on what's happening. Like when Gwen hugs her father, like the background turns like pink and everything. It's... But then there's other really experimental ideas where like backgrounds and colors will change at a whim like at one point like there's a point where gwen's hair goes from like blonde to like a light blue and the background is different it changes colors and it's like i've never seen anything like that before and it's it's it works it's red letter media it it's borderline experimental but it, it it paid off great that was like that was my yeah. that, moments like that made the movie for me and yeah. it was uh, basically like anything with Gwen. Like the stuff with Gwen and her dad was probably my favorite stuff in the movie. Like just the wow. way it's shot, the way it's delivered. Um, Gwen was like the major highlight of the movie for me. And I, I honestly wasn't expecting that too much, but yeah. she was great. Yeah, I mean, this reminds me of like old D- 
Disney films like uh, Aristocats or, or Cinderella or some of those where like, in Gwen's world, it, it's it's not a flat color. I, I don't mean that, but like one color and like it's got like sketches of furniture around them that aren't really colored specifically. And, and I like that look. Mm-hmm. You know, then like the watercolors drip like tears, like during some of the emotional scenes Gwen has with her father. I mean, yeah. Gwen's world especially was the big takeaway I had in terms of how they stepped up the animation and the art style in general because it just looks amazing. Oh, for sure, definitely. It, it, and it's just amazing that something as experimental as this is is out there as a mainstream studio film that's also aimed at kids and families. Mm-hmm. And as a character, when, when Spider-Gwen was created for the comics... It, it was largely due to the popularity of Emma Stone and the amazing films. And they did a lot of stuff with Gwen that felt a lot like let's capitalize on this thing that's popular. And I didn't really, at the time I didn't feel she was a super well-defined character and didn't resemble Gwen Stacy at all. And it was like, okay, we took a name and we slapped it onto a totally different character. But Gwen in this movie is really, really well-defined and is a Mm -hmm. well-rounded character. And her relationship with Captain Stacy, who was killed off in the comics, which is, again, a thing of discussion in this film, um, they make their relationship really interesting. And this whole idea of canon events and just about every Spider-Man's life getting bit by a spider of some kind and the death of a loved one like Uncle Ben or Uncle Aaron for Miles' case and then the death of a police captain. that That's close to Spider-Man. Like, I didn't even consider that as a, a thing that you could do. Like, I, I know that that's a thing that happens because Captain Stacy is an important character in early Spider-Man comics, but I thought it was really interesting in terms of making that, like, a thing, like a major plot point in this movie because our two main characters have dads who are police captains, so it's very interesting. Um, so I guess... Before, okay, I feel like we got to talk about the, the canon events. I, I think there's no way we can dance around <laughs> it any longer. Yeah. So, what do you think of the canon events? In theory, I think they're a really neat idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, kind of what, basically what you just said. It's it's a cool concept. It's like these, basically, hallmarks of, uh, of Spider-Man stories. They're like things, they're predetermined things that will happen to every Spider-Man at some point in, in time. Uh, where it loses me a little bit is where the consequence of it comes from. Because uh, the, the film makes it, or at least my interpretation, is that if you mess with a canon event, if you alter the history of like what is supposed to happen, then it breaks that universe, kind supposedly, of? Supposedly. Supposedly. But it it can also be contained, which we saw. Mm-hmm. But and and then sometimes it just flat out doesn't. Because so, it, so there's, I'm with you there. Like I, this was a, the big thing that I had trouble accepting on on my first viewing because I didn't buy that. Almost every Spider Man would be okay and complacent with this idea because to me, in my mind, Spider Man is a character that will that will do his best to save people. And Mm -hmm. if he knowingly knows that a person has to die and he can't do anything about it. And otherwise like the universe will unravel like that. It doesn't really ring true to me, but I think there's enough clues to suggest that this is a concept that will get subverted and beyond. Again, that's what I mean. It's like how I I feel about this now. It, it could it could be completely different than how I feel about it ten months from now. Because but, the, the, the thing about it is, Peter B. Parker's baby Mayday is technically an anom- anomaly because she only exists because of Miles Morales. <laughs> so, or what about Miles himself? And Miles they, himself. They, they even yeah, say so he's I, the original. But the idea. Of- like I get the idea of this is to push Miles as the hero of the story, and he, of course, he would be the one to rebel against this. And he pushes against the canon. Uh, but I guess I, I can't talk about this anymore without gushing about my favorite Spider-Man, 
in this movie uh, for a second, which I, I don't know if many people know this about me, but I'm a really big Miguel O'Hara fan. Mm-hmm. And I'm not really a gatekeeping type. I'm very happy that a lot of people know about Miguel now and he's grown in popularity. Like I see his name trending on Twitter this past week and and there's a lot of fan art and a very specific audience that really like him. But I mean, Mm -hmm. hey, that's good. That's fine. So (laughs) I had some 2099 comics when I was a kid, uh, you know, first getting into comics and I liked them because it was Spider-Man, but it was different. Mm -hmm. So it was intriguing to me, but then in my teens, I thought, I'm going to read some of that 2099 stuff now. So I I do own every issue of Spider-Man 2099 that Marvel published over the years. So this is a character that I know pretty well, because I I think people would ask, do you like this interpretation? Because he's kind of the villain of the movie. And I do, because it is still very in character for Miguel to be like this. I mean, his whole shtick when he works for Alchemax, uh, which was a company that was featured in the first film, which I thought would, that was something else because it, it, it comes from 2099 Comics. I was like, what? But in the comics, he creates a spider serum that basically, like, to try and replicate the Spider-Man of the 1990s at that point. So he studied that Spider-Man a lot and has tried to create a spider serum for this company. And so so that he wouldn't leave the company, his boss basically injects him with a drug that bonds itself to your DNA, and you'll go through withdrawals and die if you don't continue taking it. So Alchemax make the drug so that people can take it, but if you aren't getting it through them, then you're definitely getting it illegally. Then that's going to be bad for you as well. So in order to not be under the, the thumb of Alchemax for the rest of his life, he basically takes the serum the spider serum and that's why he has these different spider abilities like he doesn't have spider sense but they call him like a vampire in the movie and he has these claws like he he has a spider's bite like a venomous bite and he has these talons on his hands and feet that allow him to climb so he's not sticky so different abilities and, and again it separates him from peter parker but also separates him because he wasn't bitten by a spider. Like, this was a thing he did to himself. So Mm -hmm. you see him in the movie injecting something into his arm, and that made me go, oh, my God, that's incredible that I'm seeing that on the big screen. But him being obsessed with the lore of Spider-Man, like, if you want to put it that way, is very in character for comic book Miguel as well, because he studied Spider-Man. That's part of his job. And all these little things like his interactions with Lila, his uh, hologram AI lady. Like, she looks very different, especially when compared to the early 2099 comics, but their back and forth is pretty true to the comics. And that's something that, on the whole, is something I do appreciate with with, um, these characters, is that they do new things with these characters, and they sometimes they revamp the designs, like like Spider-Punk, for instance. But they mm-hmm. stay true to the main idea of the character. I mean, I mean, except maybe Ben Riley, but it might be, we'll get it to him later. <laughs> but like little things, like as a, just as a fan, like seeing. I mean, what's it, it's essentially? I was about to say New New York, but it's essentially that New Wave of York, <laughs> New New uh, York. But it, but that's well. exactly what it is. Essentially, <laughs> like in the comics, they build a New York on top of the old New York, basically. So it is basically New New York. It's Futurama, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and while we're on that topic, um, in the in the second issue of 2099, when he shows up and you see the thought bubbles of, well, I got to say something to get this criminal. And, and his big line he says is, hi. And he goes, <laughs> okay, that wasn't it. Uh, it like, he's the non-quippy Spider-Man. And in the movie, there's a big bit before where um, all the spider people are like, I have something funny to say because they all quip. That's that's Spider-Man's thing. And then it gets to Miguel and Peter B. Parker is like, you know, Spider-Man's meant to be funny. And he's just standing there as his baby is crawling all over him. And he just looks like he wants to kill someone. Like I, I really <laughs> appreciated that. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I love yeah. playing 99 in this a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know who isn't very happy right now? Uh, ben Riley fans. 
<laughs> oh, I, I've I've heard. <laughs> yeah, so Ben Riley is essentially reduced to like a '90s edge lord. Like he's very angsty in this movie, but he looks spectacular. Uh, no oh, yeah. pun intended. I mean, we'll get to, we'll get to him. Mm-hmm. Um, but like when he does like that pose on like like he's on top of a building and it's raining and he's in the classic Spider-Man pose and everything, and I was like. Wow. Uh, again, it's like I'm looking at this. I- I'm looking at this in a movie theater. This is amazing. It was perfect. And then he just says, perfect pose. Something's happened in the alley. I better check it out. And, and it's Andy <laughs> Samberg. And there's also a bit with him when Miguel is ordering him and Jess to do something. And he goes, yes, dad. And it, it's just great. I, I like. I understand if you're a super big Ben Riley fan. If you're like, oh, that's all he was, just a joke. I mean, I don't know. Nobody said that about Spider-Man Noir in that first film, and that and he was nothing like the comic version. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if I'm gonna be honest, neither is Spider Ham. You know, Spider Ham in the comics isn't necessarily like a Looney Tunes type character. And, and and you can even say the same for Peter B. Parker as well. He's yeah. pretty much all comedy. And I like I remember the trailers for the first one thinking, I don't know if I'm gonna like this movie because it was like silly Peter Parker, but then you get mm-hmm. both and you understand why he's in the position that he's in. And uh, again, you have to separate yourself and go, Okay, this isn't necessarily the Peter Parker that I'm meant to be familiar with. This is kind of a representation of him a little bit and it's and it's also a children's film and there was a bit in the movie where all the kids in my theater laughed when the spot disappeared and milo said he kicked his own butt um all of the kids <laughs> in my theater laughed yeah <laughs> on that note let's talk about the spot <laughs> uh, oh. i don't know if you heard this uh but apparently it was Avia Rod's idea to have the spot be the main villain. Interesting. That does not sound like Avia Rod at all. <laughs> yeah, that's what's going around right now. It, look, maybe this will change with more context and time, but for right now, this is the thing about this is the thing about Avia Rod. He makes a lot of claims that anyway, uh, he's fine. He's produced some movies I really like. I can't totally hate the man, but <laughs> <laughs> he apparently suggested to Lord and Miller that the spot be the villain, and Lord and Miller were like, I don't know about that, but then decided to go with it. And um, just to shed some light real quick, he the spot is a character I like a lot. Uh, he's in the 90s cartoon, and I thought he had a very fun and interesting power of having these uh, black hole portals all, all over his body that he messes with Spider-Man, but... Uh, obviously with his design and everything, he's kind of a very silly character, and this film really embraces that, but also makes him a real threat in the movie, and yeah, it's it's funny, like, ten years ago, when I bought Spectacular Spider-Man number 98, which was the first appearance of the spot, I didn't think that he would be a real character in a movie that's got a personality and a backstory, and it's very strange to have that with the spot but i love it because jason schwartzman does a really good job and i mean i i should say yeah blanket statement the voice acting is really really good but i enjoy jason schwartzman's performance a lot Mm -hmm. and it's something else that's funny uh is almost everyone in this plays a live action marvel character as well but almost um, Almost. I mean, Haley Steinfeld, Oscar Isaac, Daniel Kaluuya, uh, the guy from Deadpool, that's the cab driver. He's Spider-Man India. Yeah. Uh, uh, Brian Tyree Henry. Uh, so many people in this movie have been in live action Marvel movies besides like Miles and The Spot, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, what do you think of The Spot? Uh, no, yeah. The Spot was uh, fantastic. <laughs> Um, they, they, they wrote the the line perfectly. They knew what they were getting into with Spot. He's definitely, 
obviously not the most he's he's not the biggest spider-man name and they poke fun of that a lot you know he's barely even a villain of the week and he, he just wants to prove that he's he's more than what what he's pointed out to be and i think for a villain like spot you know that, that that's that's perfect and the he's he's so charismatic and Again, Jason uh, Schwartzman, he's, he's, he's such, so much fun to watch on screen. Um, uh, like, a, a lot of his lines, mainly, like, early on with his stuff, uh, are really funny and just well-delivered. Like, uh, he has a line, like, where after he kicks his own butt, he's like, I'm going to put my head through this hole. And it, it's just the way he delivers it. It's just so funny. Mm. <laughs> One of my favorite um, bits uh, revolving around the spot was when he's, like, telling his backstory to Miles and saying that he, like, just as he created Miles, Miles created him. And then Miles' dad is like, why'd you make that guy Spider-Man? <laughs> <laughs> I just love that so much. Yeah. And on that note, real quick, I, I think the parents are so great. They're they're great characters. Oh, yeah. Movie. Rhea sure. Morales, I think, stole the show for me in this movie. Which mm-hmm. is a sentence I never thought I would say. Because I don't think I've ever cared for that character at all. In anything. And no, she was she was great in here. Yeah. And uh Yeah, and on top of that, there's just really fun action sequences revolving around the spot. And, and just in general, like throughout the movie, I mean there's really like that chase sequence throughout the spider headquarters is really exciting and also really fun and entertaining i mean yes there's a lot of cameos in the movie like we see a live action (laughs) childish gambino playing the prowler which Mm -hmm. i assume he's playing the mcu character he played in homecoming that is now the prowler in that world i mean it's just interesting how how so much of the miles morales creation has to do with donald glover like i mean he was the first person to voice the character in the ultimate spider-man cartoon Mm-hmm. And the fan casting of people wanting him to play Spider-Man when The Amazing Spider-Man was coming out, and that scene in Community when he's dressed like Spider-Man, like, all of that leads to little moments like this, which is kind of incredible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, through this, this is where um, Spectacular Spider-Man shows up as well, and he's voiced once again by Josh Keaton, and we even see some footage from an episode in the background. And, and obviously we see Tom McGuire and Andrew Garfield in archival footage as well. But it was pretty cool to see Spectacular Spider-Man back because he was obviously dealt a pretty bad hand. Uh, Josh Keaton, mm-hmm. uh, especially when he thought he was going to play Spider-Man and actually recorded dialogue for Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. And they just didn't use it and it was replaced by Drake Bell without being told it was happening. Yeah. Um, but he's back. He's back, and it was, it was definitely great to see him. Um, even though I, I don't think either of us are one hundred percent that he'd be okay with all the deaths, but you know, well, Josh still... Keaton actually had something to say about that recently. I think he did a Twitch stream where he kind of explained his interpretation of it. Where like, because you do see in this movie when you see all the Captain Stacy's dying. You do see Spectacular's Captain Stacy in his arm, so we're led to believe at some point that shows continuity, Captain Stacy dies. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, but in the way he the way he put it was that after dealing with all the tragedy, like first with Uncle Ben, then with Captain Stacy, you're then you meet someone from the future who tells you that these things are meant to happen, and if they don't, then they like it causes like devastation to your reality and for an impressionable youth like peter parker in that show he could see miguel's side like that was sort of his explanation of it and his rationale okay i i, I don't know if i'm 100 percent there but I, I don't have an issue with like you know, some of the Spider-Men being on Miguel's side. Like, I, I feel like that's more interesting. I'm, I'm kind of just surprised that prior to Miles, there's absolutely no conflict with any of Miguel's ideology. Mm. And, you know, again, that, that could be something that's explored more beyond the Spider-Verse. But right now, it's like Miles was just the one anomaly. Like, no pun intended. He's literally the only one that's like, 
you guys not see how messed up this is? Like, and every single other Spider-Man is just like, kind of shrug their shoulders and say it is what it is. Um, but you, you know, see that? Like, I mean, we'll get to the ending um, where you do. You definitely see some of the Spider people have a have a change of heart. Sure, sure. Yeah, but we'll in, in terms of like the formation of all of this. And prior to Miles, there was no conflict or splitting yeah. factions with any of that. It's everyone was on Team Miguel, and I don't know. It, it feels like something like that, especially with Spider-Man being, you know, he's he, he's a responsibility first hero, mm. uh, and you know, most of them, you know, not all of them, like not Miguel, but most of them would say like, you know. S- saving, you have to save the life. You, you can't stand by and do nothing and just let this happen. You know, it, it, being Spider-Man, you have to save these lives. And it, it's weird to see all of them say, well, maybe there is a bigger purpose to all of this. Mm-hmm. So... No, I definitely get that. Yeah. Um, but the one Spider-Man I was kind of shocked to not see in the movie was Christopher Christopher Daniel Barnes. Yeah, I, I, I figured that would have been a nice little homage since that's like the original Spider Verse right there. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I did notice um, with the Jack Quaid Peter Parker in Spider Gwen's world. Uh, at one point, he's wearing the '90s Peter Parker shirt. <laughs> okay, the, the green striped shirt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but like, there's lots of cameos and Easter eggs, but. The wonderful thing about it is that they're not the only enjoyment of this movie. It's not like, uh, to, again, to quote rather me, a bunch of member berries. No, yeah. it's <laughs> Spectacular Spider-Man has two lines in the whole movie. Yeah, it, I mean, there, yeah, there's a lot more to it, which is why those cameos and Easter eggs are rewarding. Um, if, if it was just those, then it would feel really hollow. But right. along with a really great story, those mean something. Like all these spider people that are recognizable or the spider mobile and, and the cat and all those things. It's like, Oh, I know where that's from. Those are all fun. But in a movie without a story, it would feel really hollow. Yeah. And if, if I had one complaint about the cameos, it's more so on the live action side of things. You have this really gorgeous looking movie filled with really unique art styles. And then the live action stuff, it, it just happens to be the stuff that we see the live action stuff in. And like, I don't have an issue with those characters being in the movie. Like you have, obviously we said Donald Glover's uh, Prowler and uh, Mrs. Chen from the Venom movies has a little cameo in there. Um, and again, we see Toby and Andrew as well. You see the, the archival footage in there and, you know, it, it wouldn't have hurt to just do a little art style with them. I didn't think it had to be live action. I wasn't uh, bothered by it, actually. I thought I, I would, because I was actually spoiled of Mrs. Chen going into the movie. <laughs> um, but, because uh, I, I think they released a TV spot or something that showed Mrs. Chen. Oh, interesting. Visited by the spot, and, and I saw screenshots. I was like, well, whoa, that's happening. That's uh, weird. I thought it would bother me, but it actually really didn't. I mean, it, it's it's not the biggest thing in the world to complain about, but it's just like a, in a movie that is this gorgeous looking and has all these crazy unique little, you know, art styles. And then to see the only live action stuff is just the live action stuff we see and there's no mm-hmm. unique art style with it. it. I would have preferred if they had like a little unique little art style, sure. but I guess it wouldn't it wouldn't have been as, oh, it's that person kind of thing. It's right. You you would have to pay close attention to their voice, I guess, but <laughs> but the anim but I think one bit of animation where I think has been given r- universal praise at this point from everyone's been talking about this is Spider Punk. Yeah, uh, Spider Punk. What do you think of him? Um, so I'm not too familiar with the character from the comics. Um, but I thought he was great in this. <laughs> he's a little. Uh, he's quite different from the comic one, actually. Okay, um, but yeah, I thought I, I loved like how he just. The big thing did, being is that he's not British in the comics. Okay, mm. but yeah, he he essentially just didn't care about anything <laughs> in the movie. He was like this 
uh, very, he was very rebellious, and <laughs> his lines are just like a lot of them are pretty subtle, but they're they're just like so funny and uh, like I completely missed it the first time, but he has like uh, where they they disrupt the canon event in the the Spider-Man India universe. Mm-hmm. And then there's like the black hole, and it's like, what is that? And he says, it's a metaphor for capitalism. I completely yeah. missed that the first time, but <laughs> I caught that the second Pretty time. Long. That was really fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, but everyone has been praising like his art style, and it really is incredible. Like, yeah. like there's like apparently some animators have spoken about like how they had certain rules for how they would animate him. It would depend on the mood and and everything. It's just that that is insane to me. Yeah. Like, I'm not an animator, but that is, like, legitimately impressed. But, like, legit animators out there are, like, blown away. Like, this is, like, sorcery, that what mm-hmm. they achieved with Spider-Punk. And, like like I said, he, he comes from the Spider-Verse co- uh, comics. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of that storyline, that event from the comics. And that, that was, again, part of my reason why I wasn't so hyped for the first film, because it's like, uh, I don't like that storyline. It, it felt like it was it was too soon. It wasn't even that good to begin with. Mm-hmm. But it just goes to show, like if you take a concept like that, you can do anything with it. And what they did with Spider Punk is just really great. Um, and then we also get uh, Spider Woman as well, who's again quite different from her comic book counterpart. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, besides the pregnancy thing, which which was something that, that they did actually do in the comics a few years ago with Jessica Drew. Um, but this is a case where they took an existing character name and gave it to a different character. And mm-hmm. I can understand why people are upset about her, but I'm also a, a big Jessica Drew fan myself. And I, I would also like to see the Brian Michael Bendis really moody Spider-Woman show up as well, but... I also like this character that's in the movie. I mean, she's very different, but Issa Rae is a very good actress as well, and I, I found her quite inter- entertaining. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Oh, just one more thing about, on Spider-Punk. Um, there's this newspaper clipping art style that he has, and it's really fun, but that whole montage where he's explaining himself, like in the first movie of, like, Let's go over this one last time. Like that whole sequence goes by so fast that isolated, it's incredible. But the thing is, is that it's it, it takes place in the middle of an action sequence. <laughs> yeah, I thought and about that. It, when I was it doesn't it. stop the momentum of the action sequence, and that's something that I don't know if I've ever seen in a movie before. Where it's very you, impressive. You pause in the middle of an action sequence to explain a whole big thing like who a character is and the action doesn't lose momentum. That's really impressive. Like That's I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how they do that and make it good. And, and Daniel Kaluuya is just so funny. Like every line reading he has is hilarious when he, like he's <laughs> hyping up miles. He's just really great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to say before we get to the ending? Um, I, I I think we we covered most of it. Yeah, I guess we'll go straight to the ending. All right. So the ending. Um, uh, of course, this ends on a big cliffhanger. But the build up to that is that Miguel straight up says to Miles that he's not supposed to be here. Like the spider that bit him came from a different dimension, and. This isn't something they pulled out of their ass. Like, if you watch the first movie, the spider glitches. And that's a really cool detail when you're watching <laughs> that. Um, but Miles goes to this machine that sends people back to their respective worlds, but the machine recognizes the spider DNA as Earth-42. So he goes to Earth-42 instead of his, his Earth. And... I'll be honest, when I first watched this movie, I was prepared for this movie to end, just end suddenly at various points after that. Various points, yeah. (laughs) And uh, watching it again, it's like it's obvious it's not the same world, but you're so into Miles' speech and the story and him wanting to be there, 
before his father gets killed because he's been made captain that mm-hmm. you ignore the signs like Gwen and Miguel and Ben Riley are all in the rain. And then you watch Miles and it's not raining outside his window. I mean, watching it a second time, that is such a clear detail that I so didn't notice the first time because I was not thinking about that. I was anticipating him telling his mother that he's Spider-Man and mm-hmm. there are these little signs and his bedroom is also really dark and everything. So you can't see that it's a different room. Uh, but that first moment when he glitches, the, the whole audience like, like, like had a visceral reaction, like all together, like, yeah, wow, that was great. Like everyone got it. And, um, but here, Shala Ali is back as, uh, uncle Aaron. Uh, he's another, uh, I mean, He's technically played a Marvel character. He he voiced Blade for a second at the end of Eternals. <laughs> uh. Oh, and even in the first film, uh, Leif Schreiber and Nick Cage, uh, they're all in Marvel movies as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then we also get the reveal that Gwen is assembling her own team, which includes... Spider Punk and Spider Man India, which which makes sense because I I guess when he finds out that Miguel wasn't happy that his girlfriend's father doesn't die, he he joins Gwen's team. Mm-hmm. And there's obviously Spider Ham and Spider Man Noir and Penny Parker with a new uh, SPDR robot. It looks a little more like the comics one. And yeah. Spider Bite, uh, the the one that's like uh, an avatar. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess we're gonna get this Gwen's team versus Miguel's team happening in the next one, and I'm imagining Miguel is going to be redeemed in the next one. And I'm not saying that because I didn't like him. Uh, I'm saying it'll be revealed because we get these little hints that he's also not a proper Spider Man. If you really want to think about it. Yeah, he, he was not bitten by a spider, and there's no mention what his Uncle Ben or Captain Stacy canon events are either. I mean, although it's kind of mentioned that he broke the rules and went to a reality where that reality's Miguel had died and he had a family, so I guess that's his canon event was that he caused an entire reality to unravel uh, again, supposedly. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why he's so harsh on Miles about this, because it can be seen that he's way too aggressive for uh, Spider-Man, but he has seen an entire reality disappear before uh, because of his actions, which is why he's this way. And I'm imagining that's where the next one's going to, on top of telling an interesting story with Miles and seeing what his life could have been had he followed his uncle even more. Mm-hmm. And that's when we also get uh, the spot who looks legitimately terrifying, like the inverse. Yeah. I don't know if you want to call it like the inverse spot where he now has has white portals on his body. And he make interestingly, he makes a very similar pose to Miles's artwork in the underground tunnel in the first film. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just it all goes back to because they're really linked now. It, it, it it's just super interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know exactly where the next one's going. We're just I, I'm just kind of spitballing in terms of what would make sense. But I'm very excited. I'm, I'm glad it's only a year away because I don't know if I can wait another five years for this. But I'm very right. excited. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it, I think it's supposed to be like less than a year actually. It's just, um, yeah, it's coming out in March, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, from any of the strikes or anything like that right yeah but But i I imagine that with an animated film at least is that a lot of the dialogue would be recorded by now because animation has to be in place they they can't shoot something or anything like that it takes time with animation so i'm guessing things are pretty set in stone but i still would like to know what made the decision to not make this part one and part two because if that ending was always the plan I don't know. It's interesting because I don't know if it's a marketing thing where, like we talked about earlier, how Infinity War was originally meant to be a part one and part two. If like part ones and part twos are seen as gimmicks 
where it's like, okay, now you have to, they're, 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 they're doubling the ticket sales. Um, I mean, we talked about Dune as well. Dune is also another one where it's, it's just called Dune in the marketing, but the title that comes up at the beginning of the film is Dune part one. Mm -hmm. And we know the next one is called Dune part two. So that might've been part of the decision as well. Like, oh, I'm only watching half a movie. Maybe that's what people think because uh, Hunger Games and Harry Potter have a little bit to answer for for there. I mean, Hunger Games especially. Uh, that the part one of that finale, not a lot happens uh, in part one <laughs> of uh, Deathly Hallows. That is the movie where it's not as exciting as part two. I think everyone can agree with that. That's kind of the general consensus, but yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, mid, I mean, hey, Mission Impossible is going to be split into two parts, so that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. But yeah. have any any thoughts on the ending? Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm 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 excited and uh, pretty pretty much the same thing. You know, when first watching it, you were just expecting it to end a lot, and I, I had the same thing. My audience, they were really into it. Like, uh, they were they were all shocked and surprised, but they they still got it. Mm -hmm. Um and. <clears throat> I'm I'm curious as to where this is all gonna go. You can't really have too much of a passage of time though, because there's there's a clicking t uh, a ticking clock element in all of this. Yeah. So I don't know. I I, I Miles is gonna break free from Miles. Looks like. I feel like that's safe to say. But <laughs> other than that, yeah, who knows. Yeah, are there any spider people you'd like to see in this movie? I mean, who haven't we seen? Uh, Christopher Daniel Barnes. That's my answer. Yeah, that's big one. <laughs> Make I was actually trying to think of who'd be some good characters that we haven't really seen yet. Uh, in terms of characters that I really like in other versions of Peter Parker, um, I'm actually a big fan of the MTV series. And <laughs> I think that animation style in particular would be neat to see in this film because for sure. It, like, it's crazy seeing the live-action stuff. Like, the spot travels to the Venom universe and speaks to Mrs. Chen. But we see... We also see the PS4 Spider-Man. Like, he looks just like PS4 Spider-Man. So... Yeah. I think that early 3D animation that was in the MTV Spider-Man universe would be interesting. And it would also be a way to do Raimi Spider-Man without getting Tobey Maguire. Yeah. The, it, it's it's one thing I don't want. So it's a live-action Spider-Man in there. <laughs> Whether they're animated or not, I just don't want them in it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen people um, wonder if maybe the Japanese Spider-Man will show up in the next one. I think that'd be a cool one. Mm -hmm. uh, the other Spider-Man clone that we haven't really seen in these movies yet is uh, Kane. Uh, whether it's Kane Scarlet Spider or, or what. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the big character we still haven't gotten in these movies yet that came from the Spider-Verse comics would be spider uk yeah so there's oh, that yeah. i didn't even think about that one and um i've seen people well oscar isaac was saying uh hope he, like he wants uh pedro pascal to voice a spider-man for the next one mm -hmm. and people are starting to say oh what if he voices cosmic spider-man um who knows who knows yeah <laughs> um and i was i was i was kind of thinking of this um what if for this next one, they Miles meets like OG comic book Spider Man from like Stanley Steve Ditko? Like, what yeah. if they have to go to like like a prime Earth essentially? They go back to the the beginnings, and maybe the Spider Man doesn't even have a voice actor; like he just speaks with uh, word balloons. <laughs> That'd be clever on the panel. <laughs> and, um, and there's also Superior Spider Man as well. Oh, yeah, that's another one. Or even just different Mileses in general. <laughs> sure. And, yeah, Chris or Daniel Barnes would be great to see. This is this is, this is sounds like a bad comic book plot. It gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe if he doesn't want to play regular Spider-Man from that show, he could play Armored Spider-Man. Like, I like that character because he's a douche. Or the, the actor Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um... Do you have anything else you want to say about uh, Across the Spider-Verse? Nothing too much, you know. Um, 
again, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm overly negative. I, I did mm-hmm. love like most of this movie. The, the canned events again that that could all change with how that's explored or explained in Beyond the Spider Verse if it's explained further. As of right now, though, I mean, I there like there, there are just some questions I have with it, which again could be answered, could be satisfying, or it might not. We we don't know, but uh, I am excited for Beyond the Spider Verse. And just on a visual level, this movie is outstanding. So, um, yeah, it's definitely worth checking out for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the, the ambition for this like, goes above and beyond. And I think with the, the, the third film, it kind of has a response. Like, I, I think people are going to say, oh, it'll be good. But I think it kind of has to be good. Um, yeah. like, I think it has to stick the landing. Otherwise, what was all this for then? Right. <laughs> uh, that's that's where I'm at with uh, the Beyond the Spider Verse. I'm very excited for it, but I really, really hope it sticks the landing. Yes. Yeah. Um. Well, Chris, where can people find you? And you can find me over on Instagram and Letterboxd. Nice. Uh, same here. I'm also on the Twitter at Alex Galucky. And you can also find my work as a video editor for the Amazing Spider Talks YouTube channel. So check that out. They've also got a Spider-Verse review up there. Check it out as, as well. And give them a subscription. Give give my videos some views. That'd be great. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you soon when we talk about The Flash. I can't wait. Yeah. Spider-Man.